Hello and welcome to the Chainsaw Talk. Today, Joseph Anastasio. So Joe, for the single person on this channel who doesn't know you, please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Joe Anastasio. Um, I am uh, the main person behind a company called uh, Lone Wolf Audio and uh, another company for uh, synthesizer stuff called uh, Void Manufacturing. I uh, live in the uh, state of Texas, originally from the state of New Jersey. I'm a big fan of uh, extreme music, specifically death metal, and that is uh, my focus with what we do at Lone Wolf. I, may, uh, I make a pedal that you may be familiar with called the um, Left Hand Wrath. And uh, yeah, that's probably about all there is. So first of all, let's uh, quickly talk about your uh, company or your um, pedals. And I think it's fair to say that uh, the left hand breath, uh, or uh, most probably the uh, predecessor, the uh, enormous store left hand path, have started yeah. this whole HM2 clone scene, or at least gave it a huge push. My question is, uh, do you remember those early days? And uh, just tell us a bit about it. Yeah, um, when I started doing, uh, when I started making pedals, it was about 2010 or so. Um, I uh, had a, a friend out in New Jersey who asked me when I was living out there. Um, they said, like, oh, man, you know, I got this broken HM2. You know, you should, uh, you know, it'd be cool if you could make one. And I'm like, oh, you know, like I was learning at that point. At that point when I was learning stuff, I didn't fully know um how to get that pedal working. And I know from looking, uh, now I know it took me a little bit, but uh, I was looking through some of the, you know, like the service manual schematic, it's missing an integral part that lets the two, you know, it reamplifies the uh, post clipping stage into the EQ. There's a certain biasing resistor that's not there. Um, now that, that part there, um, myself and uh, Nick at Dunwich both had the same issue. And when I was at Enormous Door, I had a working version of it, but, like, the EQ was kind of, like, not fully going. Mm -hmm. We were talking about it back and forth at the time. And I let, you know, I told him, I said, hey, you know, this is what I'm doing here. This is what's going on here. I know you're working on this. I have one that's working, but what are you doing with the, you know, what are you doing for, like, this one section? Because I know it's, like, this is the part where it acts up. And he's, like, oh, you know, that thing doesn't work that way. I was like, mm -hmm. oh, all right, cool. You know, so we both, you know, in, 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 it basically, in effect, we were not trying to make the same pedal as each other. Yeah. yeah. But I had mine, I had mine working at, uh, I, it was actually a 10 knob pedal, the original LHP. Oh, okay. It was a, uh, it was a four knob HM2 with a clipping toggle into a six knob uh, bandit preamp. So we were going we, I was back then I was doing a, a dual pedal version of it that I've never released that version of the pedal, by the way, like publicly, but I had a prototype of it. Mm. Um, so what we did is we, you know, I, I said to him, I was like, oh, well, I'm going to do this here. But then I moved it up to a five knob version by decouple in the mids. And I, then I added the added EQ section for the presence on a foot switch for the LA, uh, the wrath that never made it into the LHP because we wanted to make a one foot switch easy to build pedal. Yeah. You know, just turn it on and go. So I, I remember that. My friend Justin, actually, who I'm helping out with uh, his medical bills right now, some of his stuff, with that Cyber Demon pedal I put up, Justin was working with me at the time, and he was there when we ironed out, like, the final, final one. In, uh, okay. It was uh, early 2012. We had that pretty much set up. And then 2013, we started taking orders for it. It was uh, around uh, January or February. And then it was fully, you know, out at that um that next south by okay so we had it yeah so we had the whole thing up and ready then i, I remember all of it putting it together um i had a, a a few other versions of it i had a uh uh because the gain section into the thing i always like you know like i said there um the there's a a, a boss info sheet that doesn't fully show you what this one part does yeah yeah and uh so i had a couple versions of it where i built it with uh, two or three different front ends going into it, but with the EQ. I had another one. There's uh, four or five pedals out there, uh, original Black Mesas, actually. Mm -hmm. um, 
have the H the four band HM2 EQ in it with a uh, with the uh, sub mid sweep that I put on the deluxe later, some stuff like that. So I I had been messing with that idea for a while, but uh, I remember early on when I was asking people, you know, when I started out, I was in a bunch of the you know DIY groups and stuff asking. I said, hey, you know, I'm trying to make this thing do this, and I just remember people were like, why would you make that pedal? No one likes it. <laughs> You know, they're like, why would you make this? And it was like, no one cared. <laughs> and then, and then now it's 2022, and uh, everybody cares. It's, yeah. it's good, you know. I mean, it's it's good for the sound. Maybe a few of them I don't personally care for because I don't I don't think I think that they go backwards mm -hmm. from what makes the sound good. I feel that they uh, they kind of uh, they kind of negate what makes that mid range sound good in favor of maybe a. a, a a slower kind of you know sludgier type yeah. of deal or maybe maybe going for a more modern approach to it and it's it, there's definitely a very specific way that that sound works and what makes it great and there's definitely a way that if you go too far from that it doesn't sound good anymore yeah at, at least in uh, uh, both our opinions so yeah that's what i'm saying you've played a bunch of them i mean you've done this the, you know the graphs of them showing how yeah. it, you know it'll it'll blow the low end out sometimes or whatever <laughs> and that's you know that's just a, a visual you know that that's just visual proof of what i'm yeah. saying there okay so cool. so that, that's the the early origins of it uh, yeah. 10 knob pedal with an included bandit i really want to see this one day <laughs> how i I've, I've debated doing it uh <laughs> I debated doing it, but it would be more than ten knobs. Now it would be twelve. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> it would be twelve. It would be the it would be the uh, the the lone wolf LHP into the bandit. Uh, I debated doing the bandit circuit on its own. Hmm. The way I did it, it's it runs it. Uh, the original version it was running at eighteen volts. I have a, a new one that I had worked on. I got it up to thirty five with the full uh, power amp output, so you can just run it right into a. Uh, uh, amps power section uh, yeah, return cool. jack. Yeah, I like this. Yeah, so you can just basically use your amplifier as a bandit like that, just an onboard thing. Um, but with that thing, it's kind of tricky, you know? Yeah, yeah. Some stuff like that, because you have to make sure that you have an amplifier that can handle that kind of, uh, you know, getting banged into it. And we'll, you know, I'll, I'll touch on some stuff with some effects loop stuff later on. Because I got a couple th things that I've been working on with that that uh, I I do believe that the effects loop um, and designs focusing on being used in the effects loop are uh, are a lot of the key going forward to getting a, uh, to achieving certain sounds way better than mm. using just the front end. Yeah, because when so. you go to the front end, you always have to rely on the particular amp, and I think you can get more um, similar results when you go directly to the power amp. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Um, so, and now in 2021 or 2022, you have uh, five different approaches of the HM2 in your lineup of pedals. You have, uh, uh, at least that I know of, you have the left hand rev, the left hand rev deluxe, the left hand path, the eight ball, and the brick. Uh, eight ball was discontinued okay. in favor of the brick, okay. and the LHP the LHP has been discontinued in favor of uh, Eric's signature model from Gate Creeper. Ah, okay. ah, yes. Okay, I missed the um, signature pedals. So, yeah, yeah. why so many, <laughs> and uh, what are the differences? So, there's different approaches to it in that sense. Like, like I had said earlier, the, um, you know, some people want just a single foot switch approach to it, with a, you know, just turn it on and play. That's the LHP, the Gate Creeper one. That's you know, mm -hmm. that's that sound right there. You just turn it on plug it and play. You don't even have to worry about all the different clipping options and everything. It's just set up to do that one thing. The new Wrath has the uh, the V3 Wraths now, since I've done the upgrade to them. The left switch changes the mid-range peak. Mm -hmm. So now you can go from a uh, you can go from a pushed the standard mid-range to an even more pushed mid-range with the new clipping options up top. On okay. there, and the blend control has changed up a little bit. I read the D output buffers and everything. The deluxe is for somebody who, like yourself, you know, uses and does a lot of studio stuff. Now the rotary switch on the new V3 deluxes is a um, that's set up to have a that's a six-way mid-range peak now. So you can actually go from 
uh, a cut mid range to pushing the mids away over the top. Oh, okay. And that works in conjunction with the uh, sub mid band now to let you really you can cut the uh, capacitance on one side but push the other end of it and it opens up a little bit more of a thing but that works better for uh lower tunings yeah, yeah. because the harder you push the mids with a lower tuning it starts getting a little like crackly and loose mm. but if you negate you negate some of that and dial it back it lets it do that a bit better and of course with the clean blend that likes that, that brings it up a little bit more there it's a bit like um, the, and then, the pull tech EQ, no? You uh, attenuate the uh, lows and then you boost them at the same time and then you get a much right. more controlled result. Right, right. Mm. Uh, Ender, yes, the, uh, the the V3 Wrath Deluxe is probably the... Uh, it's the most I've ever pushed it in there. Mm. Um, the uh, Then you have the uh, Brick EQ, which is the... It's the left-hand Wrath EQ, the, the version of the V3 spec of the EQ. But that has every single, uh, like on the Dismember V1, the Like an Everflowing Stream one, that has every single sub mid, sub band for each EQ tapped. And then it has every single center band tapped as well. Mm. So, so you can fine tune it entirely, but it's set up to push and boost in your effects loop. So if you go uh, send return and run uh, you know you've done the eight ball i mean the uh, the eight ball video so you know there yeah, yeah. um if you, you plug it in it drives it really hard <laughs> and you can basically and you can basically turn your amplifier you know you can use your amps uh gain and front end eq into the uh wrath eq structure fine tune that to complement your amp exactly and then get that sound yeah that way. Because some people don't like the HM2's gain, but they like the EQ of it. So that's why there's the different ones. Yeah. So there's only there's only four now. Okay. And there were five five if you count the, the, the two knob one clipping. I did the uh the uh, the big chainsaw one, but I do that every year. It's yeah, like, yeah. A fun okay. pedal. That's just a fun pedal to do for <laughs> people. Okay. Um so, uh, I think it's uh, fine to say that you're uh, heavily focused on the extreme metal and uh, you offer a big range of pedals. Um, what are the three pedals from your company that uh, everyone should own and why? The Hand Beast, because, like I said, this is what I was going to say later on. To, um, I found in the last couple of you know, years that focusing on... Uh, driving your effects loop and additional EQing in your effects loop in conjunction with the front end, which would be the Burning Spirit, it, V3, it allows you to um, sculpt way more usable sounds out of, you know, out of your rig that way. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I would say Burning Spirit, um, Burning Spirit, Hand Beast, uh, I'm going to kind of change that question a little bit if you don't mind i'm not <laughs> going to say a wrath because everybody knows they should have one um and i'm going to say the bonk which is like the new crazy like uh over the top caveman pedal i did because that's got a uh, uh a six-way active mid-range with a uh what they call it it's a ween bridge which is almost like how um the tilt control in the hand beast works but it allows you to uh change the input impedance of the front end of the amp Okay. While you go into that, so again, it lets you work in a lower tuning that way. So if you boot, you know, you want to stack two pedals and go into it, and then run the hand beast in the loop like that, with whatever noise gate you want to choose. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm tired of noise gate pedals at this <laughs> point because I can't, I can't get any more parts after I'm done with the stuff that I'm working on. So I'm uh, maybe work on a new design, but it won't, I won't call it a noise gate. I, I'll touch on that later, but because uh, there's a different. Uh, design style for it that I think is way better called a uh, ADSR. Okay, it's a little bit a little bit more user interactive, and it, it, I think it would work. I think it works better for all applications. It's a synth thing, attack ah. decay, sustain, and release. Works to say it's the same concept as a noise gate with a VCA trigger and all that, but okay. uh, it's a little bit more interactive that way. But yeah, I would say the uh, the hand beast due to just the wide range of sound that you can get out of it in your loop. It like turns any amplifier into just a fire breathing monster. Then burning spirit up front, because you know, a good boost up front is always good. And then the bonk because the bonk is just crazy. 
<laughs> it's like old school death metal from you know all the way just early stuff i mean you can even you can even get hm2 sounds out of the bonk oh, on cool. some of the mid settings yeah yeah that's always good. not like not as not as extreme as the yeah. wrath but it, it it does that you can achieve that sound in conjunction with you know you do the right loop tricks with the ham beast and you can you can even you can actually get your amp with just the ham beast to do it too due to the uh, interactivity of the yeah. uh, triple mid-range setup so next question it's a quick question i think uh, what, yeah. are, what are some of the best amps and caps to combine with the left hand breath in your opinion uh vtm 120 is number one for two amps uh if you go solid state the blue line bandit is number one it will always be number one because it's what recorded all the sounds along with studio 40. um i don't personally like the studio 40 i think it sounds a little too lo-fi mm. and um the the recorded sound of the studio 40 was more um you know thomas and fred kind of like mastered that sound and capturing that amp but then as they got other amplifiers they learned how to do it better with other amps um but yeah the uh, teal stripe bandit for a solid state thing if you don't have much room for amps that little combo amp will do more than anything you'll ever buy yeah it's um, freaking loud there's so there's a head version of it called the uh uh the ultra and there's a oh. supreme yeah i know the amp. supreme yeah okay yeah it's the same amp but it's a full amplifier so that's even louder than that the solid state one <laughs> um but if you want to get that sound out of a uh another thing a band uh, called uh black breath use vtms mm-hmm and that's how, you know, they run a uh, HM2 into a VTM, and that's the sound right there, because it's got all those mid-response switches and everything. Great, great amplifier. Uh, sadly, uh, people are overcharging for them currently. Yeah. Uh, VTMs, I saw a VTM recently, uh, $1,600. Uh, <laughs> no VTM should ever cost more than $600, if you ask me. Here in Europe, that's a bit more pricey, but I snatched mine. I have the VTM60. I... I think it's for 500 euros, shipping included, from Italy, actually. That's a completely fair price. That's yeah. a human price for it. But I've um, seen them up to go uh, up for 1K. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, the other amp that's really good, this is kind of a sleeper. Um, you can't get them anymore. And if you, if you see one, buy it, because anybody who owns one isn't selling it, it seems like. Uh, the Mesa Dual Caliber 10. Mm hmm the DC 10, because that has a, uh, it's got kind of like a, a rectifier gain structure to it with a Mark series graphic EQ. So that's a really good amp there. Yeah. Okay. And then I would say, uh, just because it's my favorite amp I own, uh, uh, well, my two favorite amps I own, uh, uh, a mid seventies Ampeg V4, and a uh, uh, 1972 uh, 1972 Nolan. Mm. Do that, but there's only one. There's only one of those amps in the world, and I own it. So that's, <laughs> that's the that's all I'll say about the Nolan. Is that, that that amp is ridiculous. But you might be able to buy the preamp version of it as the flamethrower pedal. Oh, oh, oh. nice. Uh, okay, last question regarding uh, Lone Wolf. Uh, there's a famous photo of you, and I think it's at NAM, and you're wearing a Left Hand Breath t-shirt in the style of the Rotten Sound HM2 shirt. Yeah. Uh, any change of the revival? Oh, those shirts? Well, I, yes. I was thinking about me and um, me and my friend Matt, he, he's my art guy. Um, he, he did the, the new uh, Apocalypse Now style font for the V3 mm -hmm. Rats. Yeah. Um, I want to, I'm, I have some ideas to do a thing, but I do want to do like a, a new kind of left hand wrath shirt, but I want it to be a little bit more like that. The classic version of the shirt. Uh, those are super limited. I had a friend made those for me okay. and I've, I've always been like kind of a, you know, I love the mind that, you know, more of a pedal company than a merch company. Yeah. Yeah. We, we talked about this. <laughs> you know more, more more about the pedals than i am the merch like i never do guitar picks or anything like, i thought about it having v picks do me a custom run of them hmm. and stuff and you know um my uh kyle from vitriol he uh 
he made me a run of uh i actually have it one for you coming uh embroidered uh lone wolf audio logo patch you know it's like the skull and the, yeah yeah the thing and all that so we there there is sporadically some merch stuff that comes around but um i've just always done it i don't know I've, it's, it's always just like you know it's like something else out there i'm just always like you know less uh less t-shirts more pedals yeah, yeah it's, it's your focus is a, is a different one your focus heavily on pedals and not so much on all the other stuff i totally got this let's talk about sound and yeah. uh, I know that you think that Death Metal by Dismember has the best HM2 sound ever. I uh, do. Uh, see? Told you. Um, apart from Dismember and uh, recordings with your own pedals that you know of, uh, do you have a favorite HM2 sound? Carnage, Dark Recollections. <laughs> That's cheating. <laughs> no, well, you it's, know, it's before it's that. Cheating. Um, well, I guess, yeah, you could say that that's dismembered too. Um, let me think here. Uh, I don't know if they use an HM2 because I've never been able to get in contact with the guys, but, uh, Depravity from Finland, mm -hmm. the Silence of the Centuries LP is a complete monster. That sound is incredible that they have on that record. I want to say, I think it's an HM2 on there, the Depravity record. Um, the Excruciate LP is another really good one. Uh, Sinister is another really good one. Okay, from uh, the Netherlands, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sinister is really good. Um, then there's, what is the other one? Uh, I think that uh, Entrails, the uh, Slowly We Rot LP, sounds really good. Mm, it's this uh, old one or the newest one? No, no, Slowly We Rot, I think it was their, uh, oh no, that, that's a song on it. I think it's supposed to rot, actually. I forget, It's the one with the blue cover. I forget the LP name. Uh, um, the Tomb Awaits? The Tomb Awaits, yes. Yeah, that's, a that's, really good one. Yeah, that's true. That's the, that's the one that's got really good sound. Um, and then anything that uh, Raga did with Revolting, mm -hmm. uh, his, his sound is incredible, too, that he got. So and um, obviously, you know, Black Breath and... Yeah, yeah, you mentioned them earlier. Yeah, yeah. So there's something for my Spotify playlist. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's a ton more that are uh, out there, but I, I do want to touch on this. Uh, despite what everybody thinks, I will reiterate it. Grave never used an HM2. DS1. Okay. Yep. Um, so, what's your favorite HM2 pedal that's not from your company? Uh, the one that uh, Enrico makes with KMA, the Worm and the uh, Guardian of the Worm. I think that um, I think that maybe uh, Enrico may have topped, uh, not in terms of like expanded out capabilities, but with the Guardian of the Worm. The offering I consider the two side by side. You know, the Raft Deluxe and that. Uh, I, I think that that's a really good, that's a great design because when Daniel went to go work with him with that, you know, and they added in uh, the functionality of his uh, key and gate with it, like mm -hmm. that lets you really get, it, it tames a lot of the noise yeah, in true. the pedal, you know. Um, so I think that, I think that what he does is really good. He's always, I mean, he's always been a good dude anyway. His pedal is great. Yeah. Yeah. That one. And then I think the, uh, what is that? The uh, the breathe resist that Daniel did is also a really good one. Mm, breathe die. Mm. Breathe die. Yeah, breathe die is the other one. That's another really good pedal. Both of those guys do good work, so I'm glad to see that they work together. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um. So, what's the most underrated pedal in your opinion? And uh, you can name one from your own company if you want, and uh, one from. <laughs> um. I won't say underrated pedal. I'll say underrated company, and it's Systech from the 70s. Okay. Um, Systems, Te Systems Technologies. Um, Systech actually went on to become Proco with the Rat pedal. Yeah. Um, I don't know why they took all of their creativity that they had in the 70s and just decided to focus on the Rat when they made, like, that's what my outsider pedal is based on, the Harmonic Energizer. Mm-hmm. You know, and then the insiders based on the harmonic overdriver. Um, 
there's a phaser that they did that's incredible. They did a they have a two different analog rack mount flangers. Well, they're not rack mount, but they're like you know big studio tabletop flangers that are insane. They're awesome. They have a, an envelope follower. I have. I actually, it's like the only company's stuff, like outside of like some, uh, like Chase Bliss and other ones that mm. I, like, I have every, every, I have every pedal and every version that they ever did of a Sistec pedal. Oh, okay, I nice. Have, yeah, I have. That's I was always getting them. They're extremely expensive now. They used to not be, but they're like I think Harmonic Energizers now are like two grand a piece or something for old ones. <laughs> but they're big, man. They're like this. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's why I like big pedals because I like those. You know. It's, bigger you know <laughs> bigger big, more, more knobs more better yeah more knobs more better bigger <laughs> case that's what she said um <laughs> <laughs> it's it's actually because i have my hands i can't work in uh, those little cases yeah. i literally just can't do it i can't like if i'm in there it's like no nah, my hands like my thumbs as big as some of those small pedals <laughs> <laughs> okay so next one um What's the best sound to combine a chainsaw sound with, in your opinion? Or do you say, don't combine it at all? In series or parallel? Uh, parallel. Side by side? Um, a, uh, yeah. Something that has uh, heavy EQ capabilities. So you can, if you're, uh, here's something that I've always found. And this is something that, once I figured this out, I've never touched the setting on the amp again is on my, on my amp pick, my V4, uh, it has all of the, uh, mid response switches across the top and all the switches. I have a saying that I'd say you buy a V4 and you just all rockers, right? Every single switch, push it to the right. And mm -hmm. then scoop. So you're boosting the inductor mid range while scooping it a little bit down. And, uh, anything you throw into the front end of it sounds ridiculous. It's like mm -hmm. ultra present crushing low end, like high end cuts right through. It just sounds amazing. Um, I think anything that has the capability to let you both boost and cut your mids at the same time. And if you find, you know, that really good blend of the two in there, since you already have this audio signal, that's really pushing the mids, you want something that's going to retain your low also. I do think, I do think that some, uh, some guitar tones get a way too thin, mm. you know, like it, like if you don't. If you put too much uh, high into it, too much mid into it, but negate the low, like some guys, they like that. That's why, you know, they like, you know, they play Marshalls and stuff because they don't really have a lot of low. Um, but something like, a, like I said, the Mesa DC-10, you can use the graphic EQ to boost or cut the mids there and and keep it, you know, tight. Yeah, yeah. And all, the way, you know, and all the way through. So I think that that sound in parallel with the HM2 sound is really good. Also a... Uh, uh, it's not really a sound, but if you were to go series with one, a really good high, uh, really good high headroom compressor into mm -hmm. an HM2 is it, it works wonders for it because it keeps the signal real, real nice. I use the uh, uh, Origin FX Cali Compact Bass at 18 volts. I use that because I tune down the C or A. Mm -hmm. It sounds really, really good. That's a great pedal. That one. Okay. I have to try this out. I've, uh, well, heard some good things about it, and um, I didn't know that you uh, could or should uh, combine it with the HM2, actually. Yeah, and it, well, you you can use, a lot of people when they say, oh, you know, you want a boost pedal, you want a boost pedal. A lot of people are talking about, um, you want a compressor, actually. Yeah. Compre a compressor does more than a boost in most cases, actually, um, but a very interactive a compressor like that that has like the high pass and low pass filtering has like some side chain things on it and everything else that uh, is it's basically a studio compressor in a pedal it's very very good that design now uh two modding questions uh yes let's say if you had an original hm2 up in front of you and you could mm -hmm. do one single modification for instance adding a blend control uh what would you mod and why um a single mod uh i would i would alter the mid-range for my own needs okay so making a, I would, the left and right mid-range kind of um i wouldn't i wouldn't decouple the mids i would change the mid-range um the mid-range capacitor to a uh uh a different value so it would push the mids a little bit more mm -hmm. than it does because 
as we know, uh, old HM2s, the part values are drifting, and a lot, some of them lose that mid-range magic over time. Yeah, yeah. So if you could only do one thing, change one part, I would just change the mid-range capacitor to bring it back up. And that's just for quick utility purposes. The opposite. Uh, what would you never do with an HM2 because it just doesn't sound good in your opinion? And uh, here I, I don't mean modding-wise, but, but using it uh, wrong. Oh, okay. I was going to say modding-wise, you never want to raise the headroom on it. You never want to go okay. past 9 volts. You mean music-wise, what wouldn't I use it for? <laughs> uh, no, uh, more of uh, a rig-wise. Also, uh, what you wouldn't put it in front of uh, amp, blah, 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 also. I wouldn't put it in front of a uh, the clean channel of a of a uh, of a beta lead hmm. <laughs> because it's it's way too. It sounds like I don't know. It sounds it sounds like uh like an NES game. Like it it gets this weird like pinging to it. It's because uh, it's solid state CMOS, just clean. You know, uh, a beta lead with no gain is it. It sounds sterile on its own, yeah, but once you if you hit if you hit it with that, it's very bizarre sounding. And I just I don't know. There's certain audio frequencies that give me a headache, and that's that's one of them. That's, <laughs> I think that uh, I also I'm also not a fan of uh, uh, bay leads with um, gain with uh, guitars with aluminum necks because they project way too much in a weird way. Mm -hmm. And if I see a band see a band that does that, I'm I normally don't like the way that the guitar sounds because again it's like this weird audio frequency that just like messes with my brain <laughs> and i just like it i'm just like oh i gotta get out of here it sounds weird <laughs> <laughs> I'm, i'm not saying it's bad i'm just saying it's for me it's just like oh this is giving me a headache you know <laughs> yeah, yeah i can totally understand um it's like with uh, all mixers that are hearing 4k and they instantly want to turn down 4k in their mixes because it just sounds wrong yeah Yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, I, I think I think a lot of that too. You know, if you want to go go on the stuff with mixing, um, it's weird to me that a lot of people. Um, there's some people that go to school for you know recording. Yeah. They only know they only know what they know from school. They don't. They lose that sense of adventure. Of mm -hmm. Like, oh well, just try this. I mean, there's a million different plugins and all this stuff out there. Why don't you? just try something different, you know, don't just textbook cookie cutter it, you know, it's yeah. like, get have be adventurous. I feel that way about pedals too, though. A lot of guys, they just, they are like, oh, well, this is how electronics work. You know, be a little bit more adventurous with it. Trial and error will, will yield, uh, it'll yield better results. I feel like, and more adventurous results than any, uh, any schooling or degree you could ever get. Yeah. It takes longer though. And I think that's uh, the reason why many people want to uh, take those shortcuts that are schools or books or whatever. But uh, it's, yeah, it dampens creativity, that's for sure. So now let's talk about something different. And in your background, you have a complete set of every NES game published in North America. I do, right here. And uh, I'm very sure that you uh, know that uh, still today new NES games are released. Uh, do you collect those as well? I have a few, yeah. By any chance, do you have Plumber Challenge? I don't have Plumber Challenge. I think the last one I got was... Uh, it's back there. It's, it, it's in the bottom where all the uh, all my complete box stuff is. It's at the bottom. Okay. So you're still collecting those, but not every new release. No, not all of them. There's some stuff that a lot of the reproduction stuff, it's like some of them they come out as ROM hacks, you know? Yeah, okay. So there's some new ones. I think that, uh, I mean, I, the last game that I bought was uh, I got a complete in box Kulon for PS2. Mm -hmm. Okay, nice. And I got, I got it for a really good deal, too. I got it for 300 bucks, and it's like almost almost a thousand now. I got it when I was, uh, when we were down in uh, South Texas. Hmm. At the store out there. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, just a quick for everyone who doesn't know, Plummet Challenge is um, it's basically what's it? It's a jump and run, or maybe a jump. It's a single screen play um, game, and you will die in each screen, and that's for sure. And uh, during your way to death, you basically have to collect as many points as possible. And I uh, I don't have it, but I watched the video, and it's it's. it's just uh, looks uh, hilarious and uh, I think it's a really cool approach however uh, it's not perfect but 
it really looked like fun. I'll have to check it out if I can find a card of it. I, I think there is a card made. Um, anyways, what's uh, the most precious piece in your collection? My uh, my copy of Earthbound with the God. Hmm. If I had to narrow it down, I mean, it's my favorite video game ever. So yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, that was actually a question, uh, and uh, let me. Uh, I've written, uh, "What's your favorite game ever, and why is it not Chrono Trigger?" <laughs> uh, you mean why is it not Final Fantasy III? Uh, no, no, Chrono Trigger. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you mean why is it not Xeno Gears? <laughs> For instance, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chrono, Chrono Trigger is a good game. I like Chrono Trigger. I know it's your favorite game. It's yeah. <laughs> uh, it's in my uh, it's number five on my top video games of all time. Why it's not number two? <laughs> because uh, because Final Fantasy three and Xeno Gears and uh, a game called um, well can't you can't really get it now, but uh, Snatcher exists. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Which I have back there. I have Snatcher. Back there. <laughs> Have you ever played uh, the new Xeno games, uh, Xeno Blade Chronicles? Yeah, I have all. I have the entire series. I have all the PS2 games. I have all the, the Switch versions, Wii U versions, and yeah. uh, 3DS versions. Yeah, I have the entire Xeno series. I've played them all and beat them all. Yeah, I uh, recently uh, played Xeno Blade Chronicles on Switch. I already beat it on Wii, and I played it back. Uh, was as awesome as an experience as uh, the last time. And uh, Xenoblade Chronicles <coughs> 2, I, uh, the beginning was a bit hard for me because I really didn't like the fighting system, and uh, it, but it grew yeah. on me. Uh, so, it's a little slow, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you need yeah. 20 hours, and then it instantly starts to make so much more fun. It's definitely uh, what I, I got the same feeling from it, and I was hoping that it didn't have the, uh, the curse of... Uh, Final Fantasy 13, which spent uh, 25 hours on a bridge. <laughs> Final Fantasy 13 was not a good game. I, I don't know why they made two sequels to it. It was not a good game. I played the prologue, I think, and I stopped when I was at the open world or so. That's yeah. three, four, so five you, hours into the game or so. Yeah, it was just, eh. I, I didn't like that one at all. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you what is good, though, is this. Grow Lancer for PSP. Oh, yeah, I have Grow Lancer for uh, PS2. Yeah, there's uh, there's two of them on PS2. There's Grow Lancer Generations and uh, another one. Uh, Heritage of War? <clears throat> yeah, Heritage of War. Heritage of War is the fifth game in the okay. series. Grow Lancer on PSP is number four. And then the one, uh, the other one, the two disc one on PS2 is uh, is Girl Answer. Uh, I want to say two and three. Oh, okay. And then because one didn't come out here and six didn't come out here, or I may ha I may have them mixed up the way that the order is there, but I I know that they're consecutive in that sense. You can't mix it up more than your Final Fantasy counting in the US, so that's okay. No, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what you guys got that we didn't get though, and I uh, it's an, it's another game I consider extremely good. It's number six after Chrono Trigger on my list. Uh, Terra Nigma. Yeah, we got this. Terra Nigma is incredible. That game is awesome. I love that game. The soundtrack is uh, even uh, oh is yeah pretty good. Uh, speaking of. So I think uh, it should be clear to everybody that uh, one of your favorite genres is uh, RPGs or RPGs. Yes. And um, what's your uh, favorite game soundtrack of all time? Um, Don't say Earthbound. <laughs> it's not. It's not. Ah, okay. It's not. Um, it's a, this is a weird answer, but because the soundtrack for this game exists across seven different titles actually from a company called compile um my favorite it's my favorite nes game is a uh, uh, guardian legend mm -hmm. and compile the soundtrack for guardian legend is the best 
on the console. It's 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 just that um, Guardian Legend, Mega Man Two, Bionic Commando, Blaster Master, Journey to Silius, uh, Maniac Mansion, stuff like that. That's like my earliest like recollections of just like enjoying music in general. Yeah, it was just like, wow, this is good. This is just great, you know. But uh, Guardian Legend, the soundtrack on Guardian Legend, there's bits and pieces of it that I feel like they finally had like uh, composed all the parts together because it's also in the uh, uh, Aleste series for the uh, which is like Musha and um, Space Megaforce and uh, just Aleste in general. Mm -hmm. And though that soundtrack had been evolving and it's um like robo last on sega cd there's parts of it that are in guardian legend that like they further expanded upon it so ah, i can't okay. say yeah i'll say as the core of that like soundtrack kind of thing there guardian legends core of it is my favorite but brit you'd have you can't take that one without having the others around it yeah yeah because because Mu musha went like a, a a speed metal kind of you know thing hmm and then uh, Robo Lest went more of like a uh, an atmospheric kind of thing, but there's also Suresh Spriggan, which is on the uh, PC Engine CD, which is another compiled game that has a, another evolution of that soundtrack in it. <laughs> and there's also Blazing Lasers, which is another compiled shooter that has that. <laughs> so there's like it's a it's a huge branch out there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, gotcha. Uh, what what kind of game soundtracks uh, do you prefer? Do you uh, prefer when it's strictly 8-bit or do you uh, prefer the uh, as modern as possible in terms of production quality? I like older stuff a lot more mm -hmm. because I'm big into uh, synth stuff. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I like the way that uh, you can take you know, a square wave, a triangle, uh, you know, sine wave, square wave, triangle, and like a noise source, and just, you know, you can put a composition out with just four tracks of audio that's better than most musicians can write yeah. with an entire band. <laughs> yeah, true. You know, it's, it's, more, it, it's more in the composition than it is in the production. Yeah, um, yeah because uh, you're basically... Uh, as as limited as you can be with four tracks and just uh, three melody tracks and one noise track and so you have to be creative right you, you can't yeah, hide I... behind production sounds plugins whatsoever no no i will I'll, yeah. i'll say that the guys the guys who worked at as i'm saying it's like the guys who worked at compile the guys who worked at sunsoft they're they're masters of the craft i mean mm -hmm. the guys who worked at Squ early square You know, like yeah. the guys who worked at, at at Enix, they were Konami. You know, you, you go through and you just like you. Li these soundtracks are way more than new stuff that you hear now. I I, I still think the older sound. I mean, that's why you know people are people press them to vinyl and they sell out like near immediately. Yeah, a bunch yeah. of stuff. You know, like it, there's way more to There's, I, I feel like gameplay, gameplay and, and sound are more important than graphics in every single way. Yeah, true. Now getting to that, the soundtrack to that game I beat recently, Eastward, is one of the best I've heard in years. Okay. Uh, what do you think about, uh, have you played uh, I Am Satsuna for uh, Switch? Yes. Yes. That's a really yes. awesome soundtrack as well. It's just a piano. Yeah, it's a really that's a good one. My wife was playing yeah. that game. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she digs that. She's she's actually playing the she's playing the new Pokemon game right now. Yeah. <laughs> did, did, uh, she, does she, she like it? Yeah, yeah, she said it's like Pokemon mixed with uh, Breath of the Wild, so Yeah, okay. Cool. Uh so uh so now we know what Haley's currently playing or what Do you uh, currently play game? Uh, outside of um, getting just disgusted and angry with uh, Destiny 2, um, we have a raid team that we do every week. We go through. I finally got Vex Mythic Class from playing that. I've been trying since the Vault of Glass raid dropped to get that to unlock. Now I need to do uh, Last Wish to try and get 
the gun uh, 1K voices. Uh, outside of that, I've been playing a lot of just this back here. I mean, I can't pick a game. Yeah. Like I said. I've been playing, you know? Um, but I will say that I play stuff on my uh, my arcade cabinet a lot. You know, fighting games like Street Fighter, mm. stuff like that. But but the stuff that we've been playing, it's not a video game. Actually, you might be surprised to hear this. It, it is a video game, but it's not. Um, tabletop Simulator. Tabletop. Okay. And there's people that do like fan stuff, but they take old board games and put it into like a PC tabletop format. Okay, that's And nice. we've been so we've been playing stuff like old Hero Quest. Yeah, yeah. And you know, like games like that like on the tabletop simulator. It's great cuz you can just get on there. You don't feel like getting stressed out with a uh, you know, some, you know, bad PVP or like, you know, glitchy PvE crap or you're just like, oh, this is just annoying. It just feels it gets repetitive. You just sit down and like goof around with your friends and yeah, yeah. just play board games, you know? Like before video games, people played board games. Yeah, and so, now we can do it uh, online. <laughs> right, exactly. Awesome. You know, friends across the country and stuff like that. Yeah, or yeah. the world. You yeah. can do that. It's a, it's a cool thing. It's on sale on Steam right now for 10 bucks, And all of the stuff in the Steam workshop that I'm talking about is free. You just have to subscribe to the uh, the patch, and when you load up the game, you can literally just get endless board games out there. Yeah. Like they have new board games, like Nemesis, which is a great one. Cave Evil's on there. Like it's it's great. Yeah, so sounds really interesting. Of course, it's fun. Yeah. It's fun. So, if you don't mind, I have a couple of questions coming from my uh, Instagram subscribers. Sure. Sure. Okay. So, uh, Sombre Necropolis wants to know, uh, what is the FOAD? Which, uh, well, the FOAD, it's a, it's a high gain black metal distortion. It's, it, it's focused on more like um, the original FOAD, which became the Grim Ripper, actually, for a little bit before I changed them over both again. The FOAD originally, the Enormous Door FOAD, was made for Dark Throne. And you can hear that pedal on the Underground Resistance LP. That's actually the core tone of that record. Mm -hmm. I then later, um, when I started Lone Wolf, I made the FOAD uh, V2, which was kind of sort of like a cranked Marshall in a box kind of deal, which, which is what I went for tone-wise anyway with the original FOAD. I thought I was like, I'll strip it down. I'll just add some clipping stuff to it. You know, I'll do it a little bit different here and there. It's fun, but uh, I got, you know, I personally got bored of building it, the smaller one, and I had an idea for the new one, the V3, which was to um, do an EQ similar to what I did with the Burning Spirit V3, but with more gain and have a, a three-way clipping switch on the, the, up the top mm -hmm. and then have a, a, a variable, uh, variable high peak on the left foot switch for the modern mode. So you can push or drop the high end. So you can do more. Uh, you have basically, it's, it's like simulated three different, you know, uh, three different gain settings up top with toggle in the middle would be like a, uh, like a cranked kind of like, you know, um, uh, lightly cranked low input on a Marshall type deal mm -hmm. or like any kind of vintage amp like that, like a high watt or something. This, the left setting is like when you bridge the two, you get more gain out of it. And then the right setting is like, it's more compressed and quieter, but it has way more sustain for leads. And, it, and that gives you like that real, like, you know, grim kind of mean tone to it. And uh, I always tried to, you know, keep it in line with, uh, there's a lot of different styles of black metal out there. Mm, yeah, um, for sure. The, the, blow, the blown out lo-fi version is cool and the pedal can do it. But the, uh, You know, that real crisp, like, cutting cold sound, that real mm. surgical top end, it can do that, too. Or you can do the, um, you know, the more, like, uh, like Motorhead-style stuff. You can do that with it, too. Okay. V versatility is always the key with that. You know, I felt like, yeah. you know, if you want to get one pedal for black metal into a, you know, a, the clean channel, that, that pedal is also made to be run preferably into the clean channel of an amplifier not the distortion channel because it gets like a little bit 
not good yeah, yeah. sometimes with certain amps but in the clean channel it really shines like that it's good that's most distortions by the way most distortions outside of an hm2 or an hm2 based product sound better into the clean channel of an amplifier or a clean amp like a high watt or a v4 or an svt or you know an old marshall with the channels not jumped or something like that yeah yeah true true except the mt2 this sounds only right. good in uh, one of the epics loop or uh actually as a boost i think cannibal corpse used one as a boost yeah yeah yeah, yeah. well that that's another see what i'm saying in the effects loop certain pedals they just do different things it's a lot of things it's like you know if you take a tube screamer and uh also everybody please stop cloning tube screamers um <laughs> the uh you put the uh you put one of those in the effects loop it does way more to tighten your tone up than it does in front yeah it just it just works that way you do that with a tube screamer with a noise gate that's just how it works yeah. although it it uh, creates a very uh particular sound i i tried it in a recent video and uh, you have to you have to like the sound it makes it, it definitely changes oh, no, your your amp sound no absolutely that's uh, that's a uh, that's what i that's what i mean when you take things like a uh uh certain preamps and things like that and you just run it with a gate or something that's how a lot of these guys with the extended range guitars and everything like that they get that like real percussive kind of like sound out of it it you can use it to negate certain parts of the amp yeah. that you don't like and you can enhance other parts that you do yeah okay so so, uh, Jorge André, I think it's Spanish, maybe not, uh, yeah. he wants me to ask you about the recent controversy involving your name and Facebook groups. Uh, well, I'm a moderator in a group, uh, Heavy Metal Amps and Pedals. I am, uh, one of seven moderators in Heavy Metal Amps and Pedals. Um, we don't deal with nonsense in there. And if a topic comes up about something such as what I've been, what we've been talking about, which we just touched on is, um, somebody decided that they were, uh, not happy about a response I gave them about how something works that I know for myself works because I designed something that works in such a way. Um, so I told somebody that if you take a pedal you put it in the effects loop and you run it between it it will allow you to get that result way better than just running it into the front end due to but you have to run it at a higher headroom higher voltage so if you do you know nine volts it won't work the same at 18 as it doesn't mm. work the same at you know 27 or 34 or 33 volts things like that and it's um I don't know. It, it, there was a bit of a back and forth. I might have got a little bit annoyed. <laughs> and uh, it was just, you know, this kind of a thing where somebody was not happy with what I said. And then it was just kind of like, a look, you know, you don't know what you're talking about because you don't make pedals. You know, but also at the same time, uh, if you just tried it yourself and came back and said, oh, hey, wow, you know, you would see that what I'm saying does work that way. Mm -hmm you know and it might not be the way that you're familiar with it might not be the way that you're uh how should i say comfortable with because some people don't like new things they're not again adventurous with what they do i think i mean let's let's go back to this real quick would the hm2 sound exist if people weren't adventurous with it and figured out how to do it it was an it was, the sound was an accident yeah <laughs> right so if you didn't accidentally do this how would you know you know if you didn't have the foresight to just again like i said sometimes schooling and things like that you know they uh dampen your uh, capabilities to think outside the box yeah true you know it's it's all different tones and things like that like just try something else and it's like if somebody has done it and somebody is saying that i've done this it works this way other people um like uh my friend lewis he uh he's out in new york you might know lewis he's got uh he has the channel lewis torres he has yeah. the youtube channel 
No way. Lewis himself, Lewis himself, when he saw that, he said, what are you talking about? This is how I've, I've run that thing my entire life because he's out in New York. And that's like, the, that's what we know that design to do is in your effects loop yeah. of like a Marshall or a Mesa or something like that. I mean, that's, you know, that's just the sound that they would use to do that, to tighten it up. And it's like a whole thing. So I don't know. It's nonsense. Somebody didn't like what I said and they got upset about it. And then they got, uh, they decided they wanted to do a whole uh, expose about how, uh, how I guess, you know, I'm wrong, mm. which is uh, funny. So, you know, that's, that's why I'm going to start a YouTube channel myself called the, uh, the problem. And uh, I give you the solution, mm. <laughs> you know, with things like that. But I, I'm going to be explaining all of these things at a, uh, at a core level. I, I don't know. A lot of people don't like to discuss things at a schematic level. A lot of people get uh, upset when you try to discuss their products at a uh, functionality level. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, like take noise gates, for example. Everybody started using this 4301 chip for making gates. The chip works one way. And once everybody realized that a certain company did it one way, they're like, oh, every pedal is a clone of that. But it's not because that is actually a pedal based on a data sheet from a Marshall amplifier, the Carrie King one. And that noise gate in that Carrie King amplifier is actually an adaptation of the IC's data sheet to work as a gate. The chip in a different configuration works as a compressor. It also works as a slew limiter. It also works as a whole bunch of other things. And you look at the data sheet and there's di it's, it's a very in-depth device that you can do many different things with. It's all in how you take that particular IC and make it do what it does the way you want it to. So there's, you know, things like that. And then there's other stuff. And then people are like, Oh, that person clone this and this person clone that. And it's like, well, I mean, if they did, they did. And if you ask them and they're like, no, I didn't. But then it later out is it later on. It's like, well, no, you did because here's this here. They shouldn't get upset about that. It's just on the outset. You should never try and hide that. You should always just mm -hmm. be like, Hey, look, you know, here's, here's what it is. You're just going to be, like there it is. I mean, you ask me about any pedal, I'll tell you what it is, the yeah. root of it. And there's nothing you know? wrong with uh, cloning a pedal to get the experience or to see how things work. No. So no. Here's the thing. There's no issue with there's no issue with taking a design that you like or you are familiar with and modifying it and yeah. putting it out there. Um, but be open about its roots. Be open about the origin and be open about that. But in certain instances. If you take something like I'm saying that has a data sheet application and you change the way that it works based on that data sheet, but it has, cause has, you have design constraints you have to work with it. Mm -hmm. You take that and you put, and you do that, you get a, uh, a favorable result. Then yeah, it is your design because you did something nobody else had done with it yet. So it, it, it's a, you know, yeah. but it's, it, it, but honestly, at the same time, it's, the IC manufacturers design that they're just telling you how, Hey, it works this way. This is what we made it for. Do this with it to make it do this and have fun. So that's considered open source at that point. And you do whatever you want. Mm. So no issue there. I mean, if how many, if how many people knew, um, how many tube screamers they buy thinking that it's a new pedal is, uh, <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, next question coming from, uh, same the real, uh, is there any new clone coming? There are plenty discontinued amps uh, that deserve to be uh, resurrected. Oh, I guess I guess he's touching on the fact that I did a uh, death metal version of the Sun Beta, so it doesn't sound uh, is a favorable thing with the Sizen. And I guess I, is I, I would take that's what he's saying. Yeah, uh, I think he I means did, uh, did, like, if there is some new uh, pedal from you that's based on a specific amp. Yeah. A flame, the flamethrower is the latest one. That's the one that's based on my Nolan because it's a, uh, I went in there and I was doing some, you know, I was doing like a little biasing work on it and teching it up. And I was like, you know what? I already have it open. Let me reverse this entire thing <laughs> real quick, you know, and draw it out because if there's only one in the world, I need to have a, you know, a, a personal, uh, you know, schematic in front of me to be able to know how the amp works anyway. Yeah, yeah. So while I did that, I just, I took what I, uh, what I know from doing other stuff and adapted that down and made a, just made a pedal version of it. Um, amp wise, I, 
I don't think anybody's done a uh some people have done high watt based stuff. I mean the Nolan's kind of high watt based too. Uh I I don't know. I don't know. If I if I was to do another amp, um I I I've been kicking around the idea of doing a V4 preamp. Mm. Like a real big clean one, but giving it the option to have um uh, all the variable inductors and all the different switching and everything like that. Because I did do um I have the basis for it using all of the induction from uh, from an SVT. What other one is good that's out there? I mean, I don't want to do a 5150. I don't want to do a Mesa. I don't want to do an angle. I did think about this, a VTM 120 preamp as a pedal. With all of the DIP switches? All its toggles, yeah. Yeah. I thought about doing that because I modded my VTM to have one of the mid responses do what the uh, what the bandits does. Hmm. And I thought about doing that as like an additional switch in there, but yeah. I, I I haven't seen anybody like really like. Uh, I think somebody tried to do just the gain, but they didn't do all of the toggles. And hmm. some of the toggles are redundant because they're in the power section. That stuff, I think if I maybe if I did that, I, I thought about it. You know, there's there's a lot of other stuff. Uh, I'm more focusing on uh, digital stuff right now, and uh, a couple new like things like that for Void, my other yeah, company yeah. that does all the you know the synth based effects and everything. I mean, I sure where my where my mind is lately anyway is synth stuff. It's guitar stuff is guitar stuff, and it's fun, but it gets exhausting after a while. <laughs> you know, you're just like, all right, here's another overdrive, here's another distortion. I'm like, ah, all right, you know, I'm more into like you know. Well, how about this really cool EQ that you could do? Or how about, you know, if you took, like I said, that uh, ADSR design? Mm-hmm. Here's a funny thing. Um, a noise gate is a VCA, voltage-controlled amplifier, triggered. There's a dynamic trigger thing. Uh, ADSR, basically. So as you take any synthesizer and you look at the ADSR design on it, the gate triggers... The envelope, which would be the ADSR, okay. and it you know it attacks, holds for a minute, right, sustains, and then releases, and then it goes like that. If the gate's closed, no sound will go through, and that's what cuts the audio on your effects loop to you know be like a um, you know, like a gate. Yeah. But but it actually has four different stages in it. Hmm. I'm kind of working on a guitar version of a really good cool ADSR like that like a way more in-depth kind of focused you know thing I don't I think that you know I think one knob is way too little for that type of application <laughs> it's cool if all you want to do is like you know jaggedly you know play which is mm-hmm. that's all right you know a little bit more user inactivity is cool for that but if you really work on it and, you know, give people the actual option to fine tune that, you know, because if you ask me, dive bombs are important and a lot of noise gates cut your dive bombs right off. Mm, yeah, true. You know, like the NS2, if you've ever used the NS2, your dive bombs die. <laughs> They're just, it's like, so there, there's a lot of stuff that can, you can do. There's, there's so many things design wise that. I've been looking at and checking out and there's, it, it's funny is because what a lot of people think is like new because somebody's done it for guitar is actually old, like yeah. from the sixties old, it's like basic electronics, like functionality old. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, wow, like this is not even that, like, you know, it, it's not even the, once you start saying it, you're like, wow, this isn't even that like impressive to, you know, yourself. You're just like, wow. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but it's it's innovative because nobody has thought about it before. So right, well, that's what I'm saying is like you know yeah. if you if you use different building blocks to a different end, then sure, you know yeah. it could be a unique product. You know, hmm. it's all about you know just giving people a uh, giving people a better option. Yeah, you know, a better option for what their end result is and. You know, for extreme music, I feel like not enough people take the time to uh, think about what, you know, our needs as musicians is, our needs as a, you know, guitar player is, or our needs as a bassist or anything, or even, you know, your needs in the studio. Yeah. Yeah. 
you know, things like that. So there's stuff that's pushing it out there. Like I think what uh, Two Notes is doing is really good. Um, Universal Audio, their interface is really cool. Mm. You know, there's a lot of stuff that's great. Just got to, there's also a lot of stuff that's not. <laughs> True. But that's why but that's why we buy it and that's why we talk about it, right? Yeah, yeah. That's the fun about but it. Just <laughs> discussion's important. Yeah. Okay. So last question, and uh, it's from Kenny, or uh, Pure Dissonance, and uh, I'm not making this up, I can show you proof. Uh, he's asking for a Nightmare signature pedal. We can do it. <laughs> I, have, I have no problem doing it. We would do a signature deluxe for you. <laughs> well, I we, think... what we, but, but we have to put um, we have to put Frog on it somewhere. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. And what we should do is that it should be um, it should be uh, it should be you know Frog holding the sword one way. It should be uh, Magus holding the staff the other way. And then we got to find something good to put in the middle, and we could alter the uh, the skull and chainsaws for it, and just do that in the middle. Yeah, uh, awesome, awesome. <laughs> see, that, see that, that's yeah. that's some deep video game thinking right there. <laughs> yeah, I think we have to But talk uh, about this <laughs> another time. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna put in in really small, small, small font at the bottom of it though. Earthbound is better. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it doesn't matter because your LEDs are so bright, nobody can ever see it. <laughs> you know, I finally found I finally found ones that don't do that. Ah. <laughs> But it's like you know, it's a lot of people they dig it though. Like you know, if you got like smoke on stage and everything like that, yeah. they'll just be sitting there, and it's just like you know, you don't need the the stage lights; you just get it right there. Yeah, we did it with our uh, we have the Necromancer video as well. Um, we had the, I think it was the Deluxe, the Left and Breath Deluxe, and the it has a green and blue LED, and with all the fog, yeah. it was really atmospheric, yeah, true. Yeah, that's why we do it. Yeah. But, yeah. I, uh, I've, heard for, I've heard for years people saying, they're like this, it's so bright, it's so bright, and, and my wife, she's always like, you gotta like dim it down, I'm like, no, can make it even brighter. <laughs> It is bright people, though. <laughs> people got it. People got to know that it's like the moment somebody says something like that, I'm going to do the complete opposite just to be a dick. <laughs> I'm just going to do total opposite just to. You so know, if they say it's too bright, it's not bright enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't need any stage light anymore. Just <laughs> buy lone wolf audio pedals. <laughs> <laughs> just put them all on a line behind you and just light the whole thing. Up. <laughs> yes. <awesome. laughs> Okay. Well, that was my last question. And uh, well, yes, thank you so much for doing this interview. And, oh, absolutely, uh, man. I always like talking to Joe and we do this occasionally, but the last time has been over a year. So it was really cool seeing him finally and talk to him. And uh, as you can see, or as you could have heard, we have a really good chemistry and... Um, I liked his answers a lot, he goes really in-depth and uh, you, can, uh, you can get a glimpse uh, basically in his brain how he thinks when he um, designs pedals uh, and he knows a lot about pedals, uh, you could see right here and um, I, I found it interesting that he originally had a prototype with an, a left-hand path or Well, basically, edge him two into banded pedal. I think this would be one of my dream pedals. Yes, really sure. <laughs> Maybe this will be a signature pedal. Well, I don't know yet. Um, I also like that he, uh, as me, enjoys video games and collects them. So we always have a good talk about how prices are in the US, uh, for Europe, or which games he got that I don't, and so on. It's really cool. Although he's more focused on the NES, which is not my favorite console, it's still fun to talk to him. And he basically always has good advice or a good recommendation for playing any video games, uh, if I ever in the need of buying a new game. Plus he has a really sick collection. So, I hope you enjoyed this interview. Let me know down in the comment section what do you think about it and uh, which guests do you want to see in future episodes. 
so far I've thought of some, but maybe you have some uh, guys or girls that you really want to see. Just leave a comment. And if you want to support this channel, uh, check out the links in the description. And with this said, thank you for watching, don't forget to subscribe, and may the force be with you, and have a nice day. With outtakes. One. Oh, hold on. I want to play a trick on everybody. Watch this. Watch this. We're going to do the intro, right? I'm going to wear a different pair of sunglasses, so when we go into the video, it's better. <laughs>